It's that time again, so get your Bible, gather your family, because it's time to begin Fabric of Family. How do you explain? How do you describe? In Him, all families are blessed. Join our discussion on Fabric of Family. I once heard the story of a four-year-old and a little six-year-old boy who were presenting their mom with a house plant. You see, they had used their own money to buy it. And the older of them said with a sad face to his mom, he said, Mom, he said, there was a bouquet that we wanted to give you at the flower shop. Oh, it was real pretty, but it was just too expensive. It had a ribbon on it, he said. The ribbon said, rest in peace. And we thought it would be perfect for you since you're always asking for a little peace so you can rest. You know, peace, it is something that we all enjoy, isn't it? And the Bible has a lot to say about peace and being a peacemaker. Oh, how we need peacemakers in the world and in the church and certainly in the home today. Yeah, there's a lot of misunderstandings about peace that some folks have. Some people think that peace is just a truce. But I'm reminded of what one of our great generals, General MacArthur, once said. A truce just says that you don't shoot for a while. But peace comes when the truth is known and the issue is settled and the parties embrace each other. You know, peacemakers don't just try and stop conflict, do they? They're doing something far more meaningful and healing and restoring. They're trying to bring about reconciliation in relationships. And we need more peacemakers in our homes today. And that's what we're going to be talking about in our discussion panel in just a few moments. But before we do that, I want to invite you to watch this next segment by a friend of mine named Daniel Howe, who is the preacher for the Metropolis Church of Christ in Metropolis, Illinois, as he talks to us about the pathway to marriage. Sometimes the meeting room of a church building will be used for more things than simply housing those who are worshiping God. Upon occasion, it will be decorated and friends and family will be invited in to celebrate the union of a man and woman as husband and wife. They'll anxiously sit on the edge of their seats awaiting the grand entrance of the bride and her walk down the aisle. As she walks past, there will be some who take pictures of her, others who are smiling at her, and then some who even whisper about how beautiful she is. But did you realize that as she walks down this aisle and walks past each and every one of them, that her relationship with them is changing as she goes by? Now the first pew that she's going to walk past will be the pew where those past flames might be sitting. Now while not all boyfriend and girlfriend relationships end amicably, some do. And even though these people are sitting in the back of the room, they may also still be in the back of that person's mind. Many a marriage has been ruined because of a rekindled relationship. One must always remember that when it comes to marriage, there's affection that is reserved for marriage only. Notice what direction Paul writes to older women in Titus chapter 2 and verse 4 as far as what they are to teach. They are to teach or admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. The idea there behind teaching them to love their husbands actually refers to affection. So we must always remember that we need to, just as she does, put anything that could be a stumbling block to that behind us. The second pew that she will pass will be the pew where her friends are seated. Now it's not that she's completely leaving her friends behind, but as she passes by them, realize her relationship now is going to have some limits as to the information that she shares with them. The same thing is true for us as well. Wives, your friends are not the place to go for you to complain about your husband. Likewise, husbands realize that when it comes to being close to your wife as opposed to your buddies, there's a certain amount of direction given as well. Look at what Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. 
Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands, you need to understand your wives. Now, stop cracking jokes about that and saying you can't understand women. You know what that means. It means that you need to be with her and that you need to do your best to understand her. Likewise, wives, you must realize that you need to respect your husbands, as Paul commands in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33, and show that respect even in front of your friends. Finally, the last pew that she is going to pass will be the pew where her parents are seated. Now this will be the most difficult relationship change of all for, for both parties. But I want you to notice with me what God's original intention for marriage was, even from the beginning. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, we read, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Realize this, that parents are to be left. Now, we don't mean completely abandoned, but the point is this, that you cannot allow your parents to stand between you and your spouse. You can't allow them to butt in between you and your spouse. You can't invite them in to be between you and your spouse. You see, God's idea for marriage was this, that two individuals, a husband and wife, would leave their parents and cling to one another, cleave to one another, to become as one. And if they're as one, then no one can separate them. So when it comes to marriage and leaving parents, realize that, that home is now with your husband or with your wife. That's a vital thing to remember for any marriage that's going to be successful. Remember though that when she comes back down the aisle, she's not coming back down the aisle alone. If you're married or if you're going to be married, cleave to your spouse, hold tight to them, become as one. But also remember to invite God into your marriage as well. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 127, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. We're very happy that you have uh, joined us for this part of our program. It is our panel discussion. It is a time which we uh, will have a couple of guests who will uh, sit with me and we'll talk about a, a matter that uh, has importance and application to our families. And today uh, we're talking about peacemakers. And I want to first of all introduce our guests. I've got uh, with me here on the couch, uh, uh, Jeff Winters is on the end there. Jeff is a gospel preacher. He is uh, from Tuscumbia, Alabama. He preaches for the Spring Valley Church of Christ. Okay. Jeff's good to have you back with Thank us you. today. And uh, sitting here uh, to my immediate left, uh, we have Kyle Butt. Uh, Kyle works for an organization known as Apologetics Press. And uh, he is a deacon at the uh, Stony Point Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama. Uh, also, uh, I know he, he's involved in teaching uh, school at uh, Mars Hill uh, Bible uh, School in Florence, mm -hmm. teaches uh, kids and uh, with the Bible. And so we're just glad to have both of you gentlemen here with us because we're talking about peacemakers and the importance of it. I want to begin by simply reminding us what Jesus said, and then I want to ask uh, you a question. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Well, in what way are peacemakers blessed? You know, I think that's a great question. And I think lots of times when we ask ourselves, what way are peacemakers blessed? We need to really focus on what it means to be a peacemaker. When Jesus makes that statement, he's not saying that a person who never is involved in any type of conflict is the person who's blessed. A person who always avoids confronting another person is blessed. What he's saying there is that a peacemaker is someone who brings others closer to each other as they move closer to God. And I think as we look at that idea, then we can understand that the closer we get to God and the closer we really get to others through God's love, then our emotional relationships are enriched and our lives are better. And so what about this idea of peace at any price? Is that biblical? Is it a, a, a path that we ought to be pursuing at any price in our family? 
Well, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I don't necessarily agree with that mm -hmm. because in a marriage and family, there's got to be openness. Okay. There's got to be honesty. Uh, where you don't have communication and honesty within a family, you're going to have problems. Uh, I believe it was James that wrote, uh, let every man be swift to hear, uh, slow to speak, and what the, what's the outcome? Slow to anger. Mm. And, and so uh, I think we have to be honest, we have to be open, and there's got to be communication. And that means we've got to be able to talk to one another. And I guess that's, that's the point I was kind of driving towards is that uh, when we think about uh, being people who are peaceful, having peaceful families, being a peaceful husband, wife, a peaceful young person, uh, we don't need to have the misconception that that means that uh, there's never going to be any conflict, yeah. there's never going to be any confrontation, uh, there's never going to be any discussion, or even that there's never going to be any anger because we know that there's some types of anger um, that uh, would be presented positively in the scriptures. Uh, you know, I think about Jesus when he uh, saw that the house of God was being made into a, a house of merchandise. I mean, he, he was angry. Uh, but there's a difference in having a righteous anger uh, and having one that is centered upon worldliness and selfishness. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that's important for us to, to emphasize in our program today, in our discussion, how that uh, in order to be a true peacemaker, there are going to be times in which there's going to be confrontation, there's going to be discussion, there's not always going to be agreement. But, uh, you know, as Kyle was pointing out, a peacemaker is someone who is uh, seeking to move both parties in the direction of uh, God ultimately and mm -hmm. I think that needs to be our goal. Well it was the Paul to Paul that said in Ephesians or recorded in Ephesians 4 26 be angry and sin not but don't let the sun go down on that anger and I think that's a good rule for a family to use. If there's an argument within the family, if there's an argument between one another before we go to bed we need to work out that situation. Well, what about the parents role in teaching children. Um, you know, parents are going to interact with one another, they're going to interact with their kids obviously, but the example that parents set uh, when it comes to being a peacemaker, how, how much impact is that going to have on our children, not only while they're in the home, but even after the children grow up and leave the home? Well, you know, the saying is that children rarely follow what we say but they hardly ever fail to follow what we do. Mm. And the patterning of a proper way to deal with situations in the home as the parent practically lives that out is really ultimately what you're going to see the child become as they form their own families. You know, just like I used to work for the Carl Perkins Child Abuse Prevention Center as a volunteer when I was in college. And basically, they said that the children who had been abused grew up just adamantly stating they would never do this to their children. That would be the farthest thing that they would ever even think about doing. But when they were then put in high-pressure situations, the pattern that they had seen from their parents came back to them, and they involved themselves in what they said they would never involve themselves in. So how parents practically deal with the situation is so very important. I think it's so good that parents uh, try to be aware of how they interact with one another um, for that very reason, Kyle, because our children are watching. They may not say anything. They may act like they're not even paying attention. But the mother and the father in the home are really setting the stage for that young person and what it's going to be like in their home when they're grown. And the behaviors we learn, whether they're good or whether they're bad, the attitudes that we have towards things, whether they're healthy or unhealthy. So many of these things are greatly influenced by parents. So if I am a father who tends to be a hothead, uh, who believes that it always has to be my way or it's the highway, or if I'm a mother who is not content to, to have a peaceful spirit about me, and uh, I've always uh, feel compelled to 
uh, to have my way and have my say regardless of the aftermath. Even though I as a, a husband or my wife, even though we may feel like this works for us and we're content with it, we need to understand that's destructive and it may not necessarily work as well with our children who are going to reproduce our life and theirs based upon the way that they have seen us behave and treat one another. What are your thoughts about that? Well, our children, again, as you were saying, Kyle, are going to follow our lead. Mm -hmm. And as a, a father, the leader of the home, I've got to make sure that when my children witness that uh, an argument between me and my wife or uh, a disagreement, I like to say, mm -hmm. uh, they got to see me say I'm sorry. Not ever, I'm not always right. They've got to see, they've got to yeah. understand that I'm not never always right, and I've got to say I'm sorry when I'm wrong. And, and that's, that's a part of being a peacemaker. Uh, you know, the, the, if there, the, that conflict that's there, uh, resolve it, uh, you know, apologize, whatever needs to be said or done, and uh, that's teaching our children to be peacemakers. Well, this is a good discussion, and uh, there's some other things we want to talk about, but uh, we do want to take a break, and uh, we're going to watch this uh, special segment, and then we'll be back to continue our discussion today. Hey, hallelujah. Hey, hey, praise hey, God, Jehovah. Hey, amen. 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 I'm Godfrey Pitika, a resident here in Livingston, Zambia. I'm working with the Zambia School of Biblical Studies as an instructor and director of finance at the school where we are training our faithful gospel preachers. These preachers, when they finish, they go out uh, in their uh, respective homes where they preach the sound uh, gospel. We are here at the Victoria Falls, uh, where uh, if you can see, and uh, uh, you can see the water at the falls here. Many people bring their families here at this place. It's a beautiful place. God made this place. It's one of the seven wonders of uh, this world. Let me talk about something that um, probably will help you as you are listening. When we go to the Bible, we have a lot of great examples that uh, we see and read in the Bible. But this time, let me uh, look at uh, some examples that we should not follow uh, in the Bible. We have an example of uh, a man, a priest, a high priest by the name of Eli. Eli had uh, sons. But again, when we go to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2, you read verse 12, uh, verse 17 and verse 22, you see that uh, this man, uh, Samuel, failed in his responsibilities. In short, he did not restrain uh, his uh, children. As a result, his children uh, disobeyed God and they ended up uh, committing adultery with women. But again, I'm not saying this man was not a good man. He was a good man. There are some indications that shows that he was a good man. We can see this example when he uh, helped instruct Samuel. Samuel became a great leader. And this happened as a result of uh, uh, Eli who contributed to the life of Samuel. But again, Eli himself did a lot of things that you as a, a parent should not do. He did not restrain uh, his uh, children. He was so permissible uh, that he allowed his own children to do things that they were not supposed to do. So as a child of God, we are supposed to uh, do those things that uh, will help all of us as a family go to heaven. Remember, we bring our children into this world. Our children do not apply to be in this world. But as parents, we plan to bring them into this world. As a result, we need to discipline our children in the way of the Lord. That way, when we discipline our children, we are preparing our children to enter that heavenly home. When we fail to discipline our children, in short, we are saying we do not love our own children. 
We have another example of a parent uh, that did not do much to his children. This is David, the king of Israel. Remember, David was a king when the kingdom was united. But again, probably because of the time he spent uh, doing a lot for the children of Israel, he forgot that he was supposed to do the same to his own children. As a result, Absalom, one of his child, disobeyed him and he ended up chasing his own father because he wanted to take over the leadership that was uh, uh, given to uh, David. So these are examples that I've shown, are examples that uh, you and I should learn so that we can be better uh, parents in our homes and raise our own children uh, properly. I am uh, Godfrey uh, Pitika, working with the Zambia School of Biblical Studies here in Livingstone where we train gospel preachers and we have trained over 100 gospel preachers here in Livingstone and some of these people are coming from different parts of uh, Africa and this is a word uh, for the family. Well I hope you enjoyed that uh, segment uh, with uh, Godfrey Patika uh, as he was uh, talking with us uh, from Africa a very interesting segment that he did, uh, talking about the importance of uh, parents uh, making sure that they set the right example for their children and uh, make sure that they guide and lead their children as the Lord expects. Well, we're back to finish up our discussion on uh, being peacemakers in the home. And I have, uh, of course, with me Kyle Butt and also uh, Jeff Winters. Uh, we want to get right into uh, the discussion we had just a moment ago uh, where we were talking about peacemakers, but specifically I'd like to ask you, what role does faith play in being a peacemaker? Well, that's very interesting to me that you would ask that, just because I've been doing a little research for some of my work on Jeffrey Dahmer. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey Dahmer, years ago, was a serial killer. His father, Lionel Dahmer, and he were interviewed on the Stone Phillips program. Stone Phillips used to be an interviewer. Mm -hmm. This was in 1994. And Stone Phillips asked Jeffrey and Lionel, he said, why do you think that you felt like you could do this to other people? And he turned to Lionel, Lionel, who was his dad, and Lionel said, well, at that period of my life, I had left any faith that I had. And he said, I did not impart any faith in God to Jeffrey. And that formative period of his life where he needed to understand about God and people being created in God's image, he said, I didn't give that to him. And so Stone Phillips looked at him and looked at Jeffrey and said, so do you think that the lack of faith in your home was responsible partly for what you did? And Jeffrey Dahmer said, well, I take all responsibility for what was done. But he said, yes, not having that faith was something that Cause, caused me or sent me or allowed me to go the direction that I went. Contributed to Contributed that. to it. Yeah, because that's, you know, our, our basic uh, uh, fundamentals of who we are and what we believe. And, uh, and you know, the farther we get away from goodness, uh, which is godliness, then the more likely or the more apt we're going to be uh, to find ourselves involved in, in things. And certainly that's an extreme of sure. what, what was mentioned, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, faith is so important in developing our children and even in developing this quality of being a, a peacemaker. Uh, they need to learn about the importance of being a peacemaker. And, and, and this starts real young, doesn't it? Don't we teach our children this from a very young age, the importance of, of being a peacemaker? Jeff, what are your thoughts? Well, I think so. Uh, and it begins from the very time we bring them home from the hospital. Uh, as they grow up. Uh, you know, Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, adds some fruits of the Spirit. And he specifically said love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's amazing that Paul said specifically long-suffering. If we're going to be long-suffering, we're going to be a peacemaker. And when we have these traits, these fruits of the Spirit in our lives, our children are going to see it. They're going to use us as an example. And hopefully, they'll take that example and grow into it. Do you think that uh, a peaceful home actually begins before we say I do? In other words, before 
uh, the marriage has taken place? Are, are these principles that uh, need to be established in our life? Or is this something that, you know, we, we just kind of, we, we enter into marriage and we just kind of work things out as we go along? And what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I've seen uh, young people uh, go into the, the marriage uh, with the idea that I know that he or her has a anger issue and I'll change them once we get married. Mm -hmm. And to the best of my memory, I, I don't recall anyone that was able to change their spouse, especially after they got married. Who they are is who they are. The only thing that's really going to change a person is by becoming a, a child of God mm -hmm. and living that life. Yeah, and truly we can only change ourselves. Right. You know, I can't change someone else. I may want to change that person, but that person has to make that decision to change themselves. And as you pointed out, in conversion, then that's something that, that happens. I think about uh, Saul of Tarsus. Mm -hmm. Think about the great change that he made in his life. Uh, he, wasn't, um, he wasn't a peacemaker by the way he was living. Uh, you know, he was doing the things he did in all good conscience, but he was, he was involved in a lot of uh, violent acts towards Christians, but the conversion changed him. But it is a good point that you make because I think sometimes couples will enter into a marriage relationship with this idea of, I can change this person. I, you know, I'm not even going to think about this trait they have or, or this problem they have because I'm convinced they love me and once we're married, then they're going to want to change. Okay. What do you think about that, Kyle? Well, there, when you look in Ephesians mm -hmm. chapter 6 and it says, Fathers, bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. It's a bring them up in. Mm -hmm. It's a formulation of a character that starts, like you said, from the hospital. And so when, it, it's not as if, boom, somebody gets married and they're a peacemaker. Yeah. It's a quality and characteristic that has been formulated and helped to grow over the whole life of the individual. Truly, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. Oh, we need peacemakers in the home, don't we? Fabric of Family is brought to you by the Jackson Heights Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama, and in cooperation with the Gospel Broadcasting Network and Sane Video Productions. But there are a number of individuals and congregations who help to make this broadcast possible. And so we invite you to visit with one of our sponsoring congregations or with a Church of Christ in your own home area because the family matters. And that includes our church family too. We hope you'll join us next time as again we explore a family topic from a biblical perspective that is designed to help strengthen our families. So until next time, I'm Barry Gilreath, Jr., your host, wishing you God's blessings until we meet again.